Hi. Hi, Seal. You look especially cute today. Thanks. And you look especially depressed today. Has it gotten worse? Yeah. Say. Do you know a game called Wizardry 7? Wizardry 7? One of the greatest RPGs of all time. Yes, I do know this game, but I've never played it. You know what? Let's redeem the situation right now. So, Wizard of 7 is a giant, epic and uh, very long game. So in order to get the right mindset, like prepare ourselves for the journey ahead, let's just chill out and uh, remember the early days of role-playing video games. The original Wizardry was a game that, alongside with Ultima, defined role-playing genre when it comes to video games. I mean, there were other titles after and some dungeon crawling games prior, but None had as much impact or success as the two legendary titles. The events soon to become franchises consisting of many games, specifically Wizardry had two direct sequels, each released a year after the prior installment while making direct improvements over the predecessor. So you might wonder why won't I review the original trilogy? <laughs> well, the problem is that those games aged wonderfully awful, they've lost all appeal and the only reason to play them today would be to see the milestone of history, to touch the ancient artifacts of the video game past. Some of the most sadistic folk might even be wondering why wouldn't I play Wizardry 4. But let me tell you more about the torture device of a video game. In the times when games were convoluted, hardcore, and making the game difficult was interpreted by the developers as making the game good, even in those days Wizardry 4 was considered insanely hard. Its legendary difficulty can be summed up like this, take Dark Souls, multiply it with Super Meat Boy and then raise it all by the power of the original might and magic. You know, that kind of hard. So yeah, uh... I am a weird person, but I'm not mad. So after the grand kick in the cries that was the fourth game, the most wonderful thing happened to the series. David W. Bradley came on board as the lead game designer of Wizardry. And just let me quote Wikipedia on this, he added a new level of plot and complexity to the series. And rightfully so. The improvements on the formula of Wizardry were outstanding and the game received universal acclaim at the time of release. This was the first game of the series that has both aged well and doesn't require a specific mindset to play. To a degree, of course. But still, it was only the first step. Wizardry 6 was released two years after the fifth installment and this time Bradley made some significant steps forward deepening the gameplay system to an unprecedented level. To this day it stands as one of the greatest classic RPGs. The story, the atmosphere, the RPG system. This was just a legitimately great game and I would thoroughly recommend it. Why am I not reviewing it then? Cause Wizardry 7 is on an entirely different level. While other RPG series has experimented and drastically changed their RPG systems, Wizardry has always kept the formula, but improved it with every installment. It followed the path of evolution rather than revolution, if you know what I mean. The gameplay of Wizardry 7 is the result of over a decade of perfecting the said formula. The proof of this game being the highest point of the series, aside from its quality, is that after the release of the game, David Bradley left his post as the leader of the series. He simply knew that he will never make a work as great as this, and he never did. This game was his masterpiece, which he made with all the skills he acquired and invested it with his beliefs, knowledge 
emotions, his soul. It looks like crap. Well, you know what they say about people who judge the book by its cover. Let's check the gold version. The gold version of the game was released years later and... Uh, hmm... Window resolution? The biggest, of course. Uh, the cutscene looks intriguing. So far, so good. Uh, wait... Nah... Excuse me, but nah, I'm not fine with that. Wizard of 7 is a giant, epic role-playing game. It was not meant to be played in this immersion ruining window. To tell the truth, Wizard of 7 Gold had so many significant changes that it can qualify as a remake. And my general opinion is that you should always go with the original. But some remakes are better than the originals. That's sometimes true, yes, but that's certainly not the case here. I wouldn't wish this version upon my worst enemy. Before the start of the game, we of course must create our party, so I've conjured this selection of characters. Mr. Lizardman, a thieving cat lady, a gnome priest Theodore, an elven mage, a hobbit bard extremely similar to Bilbo, so I called him Bilbo, and uh, Alan Moore's The Swarm Thing. Wow. Then we select the created characters and uh, start the adventure. We are greeted with a rather appealing cutscene, which not only tells us our objective, to find the item called Astral Domini on the planet Guardia, but also introduces the main villain of the game, the Dark Savant, the evil ruler of the universe who wants to get his hands on the said item. Then we get transported to Guardia and, uh, yeah, it looks awful. After reading the narration and moving around, we stumble into a random encounter and defeat our first enemy. Which is a legendary event, but the truly interesting encounter happens when we find a road. A girl on a flying motorcycle descends from sky and greets us, yet instead of saying anything useful like where the nearest city is or what dangers might lurk around, she starts speaking absolute nonsense and then, as soon as she's done, she leaves without giving us any opportunity to ask her anything. Naturally, we follow down the road, which leads us to the field of wild orchids. You might think it's a good thing, but no. As we go into the field, everyone falls asleep, Wizard War style, and then we have to wait a tedious half a minute for the party to wake up. So obviously we can't go that way, but we can still go the other. It seems alright at first, but then an ambush happens. A gang of rat people attacks us and basically leaves no chance of victory at all. There are just too many of them. After reloading, we know that the road is not an option, since both ways lead to trouble, but we still can search the woods. What we find is a ladder, which leads us to our first dungeon. In the dungeon, we scout the area and find only a piece of paper and a fountain, which is a great resource for replenishing our strength, by the way. We then find ourselves to be stuck and without any other place to go. We start to search the area once more, which is now easier since the monsters are dead. Yes, there are random encounters, but the majority of battles happen at designated spots which don't reappear. We eventually find a secret button, pressing which reveals the rest of the dungeon. By now we of course leveled up a couple of times, yet the abilities and spells do not show any descriptions as to what they do but the answers can be found in the manual. After some dungeon crawling, we find a differently looking room with a boss and, uh, although extremely threatened, we do beat him. The reward is a treasure chest with some very useful stuff, but the narration keeps telling of how this monster tries to reassemble itself. It would be wise not to spend any extra time in here. However, the good news is that by completing the dungeon, our party leveled up, 
and got items, so it seems that the ambush would hold no competition against our newfound strengths. Except now there are more bandits than before. Yet this time there is no turning back. We've got to do it. After a tremendous concentration and some tactical maneuvering, we win. Now we triumphantly follow the road past the failed ambush and come across an archway. An intimidating creature obstructs our path, asking what business we have in the city. Caught in the spot, we try to come up with an answer, but the creature does not take that and leaves. If we go regardless, then a group of such creatures kills our group off the bat. After checking the inventory and remembering the note we picked up, we use the information from it to gain entry. And thus, we complete the introductory sequence. You might say that the game is hardcore and that it went too far with this introductory stage. Well, yes, the game is hardcore and no, the beginning didn't go too far precisely because of the hardcore nature of the game. The beginning is structured to condition you to the game. Sort of like a tutorial, but on an emotional level. The first shock therapy is necessary since it triggers a state of mind necessary to play the game, which I like to call forced immersion. It's an approach opposite to how immersion typically works in an RPG game. Instead of making you gradually immersed by sucking you into the world as you play, Wizardry 7 basically makes it necessary to be immersed in the game to even complete the introductory stage. A fitting approach to a hardcore game, and that probably sounds bad, but remember that Dark Souls did pretty much the same thing and it is celebrated as a great game. The key here is how well the game is made, not how appealing its style seems. And Wizardry 7 is, most certainly, a well-made game. I can see how someone might doubt it, based on what we've seen so far. So let's look back at the beginning, but from a critical perspective. The created characters are first added to the selection screen from which you have to choose them prior to starting the game. This is necessary so that in case you die without any save to load, you would have the ability to start the game with the same party again, saving both your time and your carefully created party. The contrast between the cutscene and the gameplay is not only auditory and visual. During the cutscene you've been given a lot of exposition and even more guidance. It feels dynamic and comforting and then, as soon as the cutscene stops, you find yourself in a quiet place with terrible visuals and unnerving sounds. A little narration is different in tone to the cutscene. Instead of being lively and epic, it is sad and melancholic. The drastic contrast between previous and current state hits you with a sense of alertness, alienation and confusion. This translates into a sense of danger as soon as you stumble into random encounters and find enemies to be strong. The girl's bright color scheme is reminiscent of the cutscene, so you subconsciously expect her to guide you, yet your expectations are crushed once again. The amber shows you that every encounter might be lethal and you should save after each battle. Dead ends of the road compound you to a small area so that you would inevitably find and enter the dungeon. The necessity of finding a secret button was a way of teaching you to be attentive to the game. Yet the place for searching was small, there were multiple buttons, no enemies and your characters would notice the button if you didn't. All to make sure that the search would not be too long. The increased amount of gang members both destroy your expectations of an easy battle, reminding you that the game is hardcore and shows you that to win you have to zinc during battles. To enter the city you need to spell the information from the note. It teaches you to memorize things so that you could use them later. Now imagine that this amount of pure thought put into the game is maintained throughout its entirety. Possibly the best example of this is the game's battle system. There are six magic schools and seven weapon types, but that is only the first stop. While casting a spell you have to choose the power level, which determines the strength of the spell and the amount of mana you'll spend on it. Same goes for weapons, instead of having a single option, you can choose from a variety of different attacks such as swing, bash and thrust, each one's different from the rest. 
This layer of complexity adds to the game's engagement due to the turn-based nature of combat. The point is that the fighting does not feel synthetic. It's not like, oh, I scan this boss and he's weak against fire. Better hit him with the best fire magic I have. No, there is no automatic responses like that in this game. Instead, it celebrates creativity. Creativity in killing, you mean? Uh, yes. And I think what I'm trying to say is best illustrated by the magic system. There are some spells which are more devastating than others, like Nuclear Blast or Mind Flay, but it's inefficient to use them too often considering that they cost a tremendous amount of mana. Yet it would also be inefficient not to use them, since each magic type has its own meter. So by conserving some of the more powerful spells, you might spend a bigger amount of mana of the other type, or the stamina, which depletes by every action, most of all by an attack option. After choosing a spell, you have a variety of options. You can choose a low power level to see if it's effective against this type of enemy. But you can risk it by making a stronger attack to finish the fight earlier, thus preventing further loss of stamina, health and mana. Even after you know the enemy, you still have to determine the right strengths to kill right away, yet not to spend any extra mana doing so. This choice is made either by intuition or experience, but in both cases you literally feel like a magician, like your will is embodied in your spell. Same goes for attacks. You size up your opponent and choose the type of attack according to your impression of the enemy. After you see the results of your choices, you calibrate the attacks and spells to increase future efficiency. Such gameplay choices are what makes this fighting system deep. To be good at this game, you'll have to learn to manage your resources and think strategically. This is hardcore, yet due to how well the system was balanced, it is also very engaging and rewarding. You might have felt like this barrage of options is overwhelming, but it's not. At the beginning of the game, you have nothing, just some basic equipment, a couple of spells and enough mana to cast only at the lowest power level. You'll get stronger over time. By leveling up, your characters get stat upgrades, skill points, new spells, it's all usual good stuff, but what makes the RPG system of Wizardry 7 shine is the profession change mechanic. There are 14 different professions, each having a specific set of skills. These skills are divided in three categories and learning them is essential to your progress. Each profession has some stat requirements and uh, as soon as you meet them by leveling up, you can switch to the desired profession. This will downgrade your stats to defaults, but you'll keep all the skills you've acquired and since you are level 1 again, you get to level up at the speed of light, which is tremendously satisfying to be honest. So to get the most out of your party, you'll have to jump from profession to profession in order to learn all the skills you want. The key word is want, since there is no reason to make everyone know everything, it's much more effective to divide roles between your crew. In other words, in order to use the system effectively, you need to have a clear vision of what you want your party to be, and then realize this vision step by step. This is another example of the creative freedom which we previously observed in the battle system, and it's just as hardcore. Problem is that changing from one class to the other may require an inadequate amount of stat upgrades. This should be avoided by careful planning of your jumps, but even then you might find yourself replaying battle before leveling up over and over in order to get the proper stat increased, since the points are placed randomly. Jump doesn't necessarily mean change to a completely new profession, mind you. For example, some of my characters were changing between a ninja and a monk multiple times in order to fully learn a magnificent skill, Kirujitsu, which increases the chance of killing enemies in one critical hit. Or my magic users, which went around the mage, priest, bishop circle several times in order to learn every spell I wanted. The list of possibilities that the system provides is outstanding. You can create any parties that you've envisioned, and also some will be more effective than others. You can finish the game with any of them. I mean, I know for a fact that one guy has beaten the game with only one fairy. That's insane to even think about. 
Yet if that's not the proof of the brilliance of this RPG system, then I don't know what is. Overall, both battle and RPG systems are among the best I've ever seen. The dialogue system of this game is text insert, which serves a perfect role as to make you need to understand and remember things that you talk about. It even got a pause button, so you can make notes. The dialogue tree of Fallout would simply make this game worse, because in Fallout the main purpose of the dialogue was its entertainment value. The purpose of dialogue in Wizard 7 is to force you to pay attention, to sustain your forced immersion. Every gameplay aspect we've examined so far was structured to be hardcore. This can be seen through the entirety of the game, for instance, there is a lack of explanations within the piece. No descriptions of skills and spells, no guiding hand to lead you to the game, no, the game actually demands that you should read the manual and then refer to it for clarifications. You have to invest in the experience, not to expect the game to make you immersed, but rather get immersed initially. The necessity of reading the manual is a part of the entire forced immersion thing, just like the rest of the game. But as you have already seen by the examples of the battle and RPG systems, the reward for doing so is one of the most engaging RPG gameplays ever designed. Just to be clear, a hard game is not the same as a hardcore game, although games can often be both. A hard game is a sequence of challenges and joy comes from overcoming those challenges. A hardcore game is in itself a challenge. Often in those games you start as a weakling, you have difficulty controlling the character or just don't know what to do, yet by acquiring powers and skills you become better. By the end of such games you will feel like a master and joy comes from overcoming the game. The hardcore continues in the dungeons, which are very complex and will possibly require several raids to complete. Each dungeon has a unique sequence of puzzles which you'll have to solve in order to beat it and uh, Although masterfully designed, sometimes they can get too difficult, those puzzles. So if you get stuck, I recommend the use of an FAQ. But you should not overuse it though. The game is very non-linear, so if you can't find the solution, you can basically go, do something else and then come back with a new item for instance, so by depending on a walkthrough too much, you might actually compromise your experience. And after you've successfully navigated a dungeon, you feel accomplished and to reflect this triumph, there is always a treasure chest at the end. Wait, it's empty? Don't overact, George. No. I was mad at first, but I'm fine now. I was just thinking. Every aspect of this game is designed to sustain the forced immersion. The game demands investment from the player. The mastery with which the game was crafted shows that Bradley knew what he was doing. This also means that he must have known that this approach will unavoidably alienate many players from the game. The question is, why did he need every single player to be immersed as much as to even sacrifice the audience of the players who are not willing to invest themselves 100% in the experience? Maybe you should go deeper to find out. Let's do it then.